Anyway, it looks like time. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm John. I'm going to talk a bit about the kernel. I hope you wanted to hear about kernel stuff or you're definitely in the wrong room. Uh, let's start with the boring stuff, a bit about how we got to where we are, and then we'll get into some of the more interesting things after that. Here's what the kernel community has done over the course of the last year. As you see, we've done six major releases since April of 2023. Each of these releases involves the work of nearly 2,000 developers. Each one involves generally at least 14,000 commits. Right? Each one of these brings in a whole lot of, of major changes and so on. It's the sign of a pretty active project and all that, but this is really just what it looks like anymore. We put out a release every nine or 10 weeks. They all look pretty much like this. So while I could put this up, I feel like I could just as easily be putting up a tide table. <laughs> um, Right, you know, and the information is perhaps useful and all that, but it's not exactly exciting at this point. You know what it's going to be. If it is exciting, um, it's usually not good news. Um, I would point out one thing, though, which is that the 6.7 kernel released at the beginning of the year had over 17,000 commits. That made it the, the busiest development cycle yet in the kernel's uh, development history. It's a lot of changes. A lot of it had to do with the merging of the bcachefs file system but there was actually quite a bit more than that that went into that kernel release. The other thing I can add, of course, is the 6.9 kernel, which isn't out yet. That's going to be due on, in the middle of May, probably on the 12th. It's shaping up to be about the same as 6.8 in terms of the size of the release. Once it's actually done, we'll probably get up just over 14,000 commits yet again. These numbers, by the way, are a couple of weeks old from when I made, made the slide. So if you're curious about what you'll see in 6.9, I just sort of sat down and typed things till I ran out of space on this slide. So you've got Intel's new interrupt and event management system they call FRED, support for AMD secure computing guests. PID FDFS is a new file system for the management of processes in the system. It's useful for systemd and other sorts of utilities like that. There's a couple of BPF things I will come back to in a little bit. We can now work with Rust code on the, on the ARM64 architecture, moving that off of, of just x86. Weighted interleaving is a memory management technique for systems with heterogeneous memory types where you've got some fast memory, some slow memory, and you want to try to optimally distribute the pages of a process across those different memory types. Um, there's more work being done in that area, but that was, the initial stuff was merged for 6.9. The continuous page table entry stuff is also memory management stuff using a hardware feature that allows you to group small numbers of pages, four or eight pages, into larger units and operate more efficiently as a result. <coughs> we have the device mapper virtual data optimizer, which is a new block device target with a number of features, thin provisioning and so on, allows for flexible creation of virtual block devices. The XFS file system has been getting live repair functionality for a few release cycles now, and that is continuing here. That work is not yet done, but is actually getting closer. It may finish in 6.10 or 6.11. File systems in user space got a pass-through mechanism. There's a lot of fused implementations that are really just affecting the metadata, changing the way the file system looks, but depending on an underlying real file system to provide the data. This allows a direct path to those underlying file systems and increases the performance of Fuse by avoiding a trip to user space and back. The runtime energy model, the kernel for a while has modeled pretty well the energy use of various components in there, but that energy use changes over time, especially if things, for example, warm up, they may take more power and so on. So the energy model is now updatable at runtime so that as your system gets warm, the, the scheduler and such still knows how much energy each component is going to use and can try to optimize that, that usage. For time, you've of course added a ton of device drivers, a bunch of other fixes, a thousand typo fixes to the documentation and all kinds of other stuff that we normally do in the um, release history. Just another release basically and that's coming up in mid-May. One other thing I'll point out in this table before I'm done with it is that right-hand column, which is the number of first-time developers in each development cycle. The number of people who, in that particular release, made their very first contribution to the kernel. So you see we're getting at least 200 people with each development cycle, something over 2,000 people over the course of the year coming into our community and contributing for the first time. This, in my mind, is a healthy thing. It means that we've got a steady flow of developers who are attracted to our community, 
or told to contribute to our community, but one way or the other, we, we have a lot of people coming in and bringing in new energy, which you need to keep your community going in the long term. But this, this led to a question that I wanted to research a little bit. So I've put together a couple of plots about how long developers actually stick around, just not, not the, the new ones. So you get something that looks like this. What I did is I looked at every developer who contributed to 6.9 as of a couple of weeks ago and looked at how many release cycles those developers had contributed to. So the very top bar there is the first time contributors I was just referring to in the previous slide, right? 221 of them is the time I did this. You see a big bar of people contributing to between two and five releases. The median is about 10. Your median kernel developer has contributed to about 10 releases. And then you go all the way down there to the bottom of it, where you have, what is it, 28 people who've contributed to every single one of the 100 releases that are in the, the Git development history since 2005. Some people just never quite learn. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we have a long tail of people who've hung around for, for quite a while at this point. Another way of looking at it, which is a little bit different, is to look instead at the first year of contribution for every contributor to 6.9. And so you get a very similar shape, right? You have a bunch of fairly recent people, a lot of people contributing first starting in just the last two years. But now you have 89 people who've been in the community ever since the Git history began, and of course beyond that, but we don't really have that in the, in the history at that point. So, the picture that I draw from this is that we have a good combination of new people coming in and, and gray beards who've been around long enough to, to have an understanding of how the whole thing works and to keep the, the community on track and going like that. I think it's a healthy picture. But, um, we'll see, any others may, may disagree. The final thing I might point out before I move on is the stable updates. These are the kernels that most of us are actually running rather than the mainline kernels that I've been talking about so far. There are currently six stable kernels under long-term maintenance. As you can see, they get an awful lot of fixes. By the time a kernel has been in stable maintenance for a year or so, like 6.1, it has essentially re received an entire development cycle's worth of fixes on top of what was released, it's the stable thing. In theory, there's not really new features going in, that sort of thing. It's all fixes. And it's all that guy's fault. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, one might say this says that we're not doing very well at keeping bugs out of the kernel if we have to apply that many fixes. And there's perhaps some truth to that. But we're also, I think, getting increasingly good, good at finding bugs in older kernels, because a lot of these bugs that are being fixed have been there for a decade or longer. They're not new bugs. And um, we're better at, at hurting those into the stable releases. So there's, this, there's some of both going on here. But in any case, there's a lot that happens to a kernel after it's released as a final kernel release. And again, those are the ones that we were actually using. One thing I would point out, we have a history of going back about six years of long-term stable releases. That history is not going to be that way for much longer. Right? The stable team has come to the conclusion that these older releases, which get increasingly hard to support, by the way, as you have to backport fixes further and further back, aren't really being used by much, by a whole lot of people. So they're going to drop that back to just two years of support for the long-term stable releases. Um, so pretty soon you will see that list get shorter because we're not going to have any more six-year releases unless something changes. Now, there are other projects out there um, that are they're looking at trying to support kernels for longer than that, but it's a really hard task. And for the most part, people are going to be expected to stay on, on more current kernels, something I will come back to in just a moment. So that's it for, for boring tables. I had some other things I wanted to talk about, starting with a couple of security-related things because this has been on people's minds a bit recently. And I'm going to start with the topic of CVE numbers, or common vulnerability and exposure numbers. The CVE system was created, I don't know, a couple decades or so ago as a way of assigning a unique identifier to each known vulnerability in software, either open source or closed source, so that when you're talking about, oh, that network driver bug, you know which bug you're talking about. You know if you actually have it fixed in a particular version of the software or not. It's a way of tracking the problems that we have. It's a nice idea, and it has some value, but the CVE number system has come under increasing strain over the years. And the real problem is that CVE numbers have become a target in their own right. 
there are a whole lot of security researchers out there or people who would like to be known as security researchers. And one of the ways that you build up a resume in this area is to have a whole bunch of CVE numbers to your credit. You're the one who reported these, these vulnerabilities. And so there's a real incentive to report, to file for CVE numbers. And we have a lot of people filing CVE numbers for things that are not vulnerabilities or something that got fixed 10 years ago and nobody's concerned about or they're not seen as vulnerabilities by the developers of the software. And this gets to be a real problem because whenever somebody files a CVE number against your particular software project, you have to look at it. You have to evaluate it. And then either fix it or explain why it isn't a vulnerability. You can try to get the CVE number rescinded, but that is painful and a long and uncertain process. And, and people rarely bother to do it because it's very hard to do. So unless it's really egregious, they won't do that. And you have to explain to people why hasn't this particular CVE been addressed in this latest software release. Well, it's not a vulnerability. This isn't why it's not a vulnerability. And that's an annoying conversation to be having over and over and over again as these bogus CVE numbers continue to pile up. Meanwhile, a lot of the things that are actually vulnerabilities aren't getting CVE numbers. This is true especially in the kernel where just about any bug, if you're clever enough, can be exploitable to, to compromise the system. The kernel is at a unique spot in the system that, that may, turns a lot of ordinary bugs into vulnerabilities. So a lot of things that developers just fix, saying, okay, this is just a bug, I'll fix it. They don't know that they're actually fixing a security vulnerability, and it maybe doesn't come out that way for years afterwards. So if you or only picking up fixes that have CVE numbers attached to them, you're missing most of the vulnerability fixes, that sort of thing. So as a result of all of this, the kernel community has pretty much ignored CVE numbers for a long time. I mean, seriously, right? People just don't bother with, with them because they, they've had very little relevance to what we've actually done. But nonetheless, they're out there and they're annoying and there has been pressure to do something about it. So with the CVE system is the concept of a CNA, or a Certificate Numbering Authority. For any particular body of software, there is a CNA out there that is charged with assigning CVE numbers for that. And there's, there's a really big one that handles just about everybody. But any given project is able to set itself up as a CNA for its own software and take control of the CVE number system for their own software. And increasingly, free software projects are doing this because it's not just the kernel that has had this problem with bogus CVE numbers. It's everywhere. And so once again, I typed until I ran out of space. But there are many dozens of free software projects at this point that have set themselves up as their own CNA so that they can get a handle on this problem. And as of, um, sort of late, towards late February, the kernel has done the same thing. It is now also a CNA and is in charge of its own CVE numbers, which changes the situation in a number of ways. But you have to think about this in a community where people haven't thought much about CVE numbers for a while and where just about any bug could be a vulnerability. How do you assign your CVE numbers? How do you go through this process of looking at thousands of fixes and, and figuring out what should, should be a CVE? The answer can be found in the kernel documentation. Is there and it's saying basically Due to the layer at which the kernel operates, almost anything could be a vulnerability. So we're going to be careful, and we're going to be cautious, and we're going to assign a CVE number to just about anything that looks like it could be a vulnerability at some point in the future. This, they say, explains the seemingly large number of CVE numbers for the, for the kernel. So what does that mean? Well, when I made this slide, this is again about two weeks ago, about 800 of them had been assigned since, since late February. Um, that number is out of date. There were about 100 of them I found this morning. <laughs> so this is going to stir things up a little bit. Because if you are trying to maintain a kernel by pack porting a fix for every CV number that you see, you're going to have a very painful life, right? And of course, there are companies and people who are doing exactly that. And it's not really clear how they're going to handle this. But in the end, there's really only a couple of ways to try to stay secure, right? One is that you can do this, track CVEs and backport fixes and all that, and um, deal with the pain that comes with it. 
The alternative is that you run the stable updates that I was talking about before. CVE numbers will not be assigned until the fix is actually in, merged into the, into the kernel tree. So if you are running the latest stable update, you by definition have a fix for every single CVE that has been assigned to the kernel, at least every public CVE. <laughs> um, so that's in a sense is a really simple way of keeping track of this, right? You don't have to worry about it, just run the stable updates, you have a fix for every single one of them. And uh, that is the advice again that appears in the kernel documentation. This is actually something that the, the kernel community has been saying for years. This is not new advice, but it becomes a little bit more urgent now. And it's worth looking at people who have actually done this. Um, consider, for example, the, the Android project, which has been pushing its common kernel image for a while to try to get the same kernel on all Android devices, or at least a very small number of, of well-supported kernels. Those track the stable updates now, a little ways behind, but they track them. And the Android security people looked at this a little while back and looked at the vulnerabilities that had been reported against the kernel that had affected Android devices and found that they had already shipped the fix for almost all of them by the time those vulnerabilities were disclosed. Because if you're shipping the stable updates, you've simply got those fixes before they're known to be security problems. The only problem, of course, is, um, is the slide that we saw before. If you are shoving 10 or 20,000 fixes into a kernel that's supposed to be stable, there's no way that there's not going to be some bugs in those things that you're merging, right? You just, that's just not the way the world works. And so there have been some. There have been regressions, an occasional severe one. So this, this worries people, and not everybody wants to do this. But the truth of the matter is that most of the time, things work pretty, pretty, pretty well. If you stay one stable update or two behind, which is really just a couple of weeks, then anything that's really bad will have been found out by then. And you'd be pretty much on top of things. So as unnerving as it may be, that really is the best answer that we have as a community for staying secure, is to simply track the stable updates. It has all of the fixes that we have. They're all tested together. It's maybe not ideal, but it's the best answer that we have. So while I'm on security, um, you may have heard about this. Uh, you know, where over the course of a couple of years, a hostile actor was able to gain a position of trust in the XZ project and, and to merge some very hostile code there that was pretty close to being widely distributed out there. So I got to start by saying quite simply, this is not a kernel vulnerability, right? The kernel project was not targeted in this. This was the, they, they were targeting elsewhere in the stack. So, the XD vulnerability did not directly affect the kernel. That said, this patch was in Linux Next when all this stuff came out. All right, if you look at that line there, I guess my little thing doesn't work. It's taking the output of the XD command and feeding it directly to the shell with an eval command. The idea was to set some um, environment variables. It probably does exactly that. In, in the current version or the version of XE that was out there. But this has been pretty widely interpreted at this point as setting the stage for a future attack against the kernel build process. You know, it was sort of in the sites. It could have happened in the future, but they were still quite a ways from that. And that never actually made it into the, into the mainline kernel. So the XD backdoor is not a kernel vulnerability, but could it be? Could we be the subject of an attack like this? I draw your attention to this worthy quote from Russ Albury. He's a Debian developer, not a kernel developer. But he said that the real problem here is that much of the software we depend on is underfunded and supported by volunteers working on their own time and they are burning out. This, in many ways, is the true root cause of this entire event. Right? The XZ attack was an attack against an overwhelmed maintainer. So, you know, in the kernel community, we have a, we're in a nice position in that. Almost everybody who works on the kernel is paid to do that. So you might say, okay, fine. Our maintainers are paid. We're not going to have the same sort of burned out maintainer problem, right? But it's not that simple, right? If you ask around, there are a lot of kernel maintainers who are crying out for help. There are a lot of maintainers who are, in fact, burning out, who are having a hard time keeping up with things. And there's a lot of reasons for this. 
Some of them are self-inflicted, some of them are not. But a key piece of this that I would like to point out is nicely identified by this quote from Steve Rostep. He says, I'm a maintainer with a full-time job that is not my maintainership. Technology companies like to hire kernel maintainers because they bring in a lot of expertise. It's a nice name to have on the payroll. They're a whole lot less enthusiastic about paying them to be kernel maintainers. And so a lot of people who are kernel maintainers have nice jobs, but they're doing their maintenance on their own time afterwards. So we have this problem. Again, we do have overwhelmed and burned out maintainers in the kernel, right? This is part of a general sort of theme of dark areas in the kernel and beyond, honestly. This is not just a kernel problem by any stretch. But there are a lot of things that companies, even though they support the project, don't see as being their problem. It's something they need to support. My favorite one to, to harp on is documentation, of course, since that's kind of my area. There are thousands of people who are paid to contribute to the kernel every year. There is not one person whose job it is to write kernel documentation, not one. I think that that is a pretty strong condemnation of this whole not my problem thing that we see. But it isn't limited to that. The kernel has its own build system. It is obscure, it is complex. Not too many people understand it. And it has one maintainer, a single person maintaining it. We just saw that, that, that patch from the XZ attacker, which was a, essentially a build system sort of attack. You know, this sort of thing I think is a vulnerability. This is something we need to be paying a lot more attention to because nobody really supports the build system. We all depend on it. Nobody is really paying for it to be worked on. There are a lot of core kernel areas that are underfunded. If you just think about the work that had to be done to get the real-time work funded, this is something that is an integral part of a lot of products that companies are shipping, but we still couldn't get that work funded to actually push that work forward. Drivers for older hardware, once a company reduce, releases a new version of its widget, it really loses interest in supporting the older ones. Or rather, those went away and people bought the new ones. And so supporting those falls on the community and on the maintainers again. So <clears throat> all these things are not really supported, and maintainers as a whole are not supported by our community. Right? We have worked pretty hard at trying to convince companies that they need to give back to the open source projects that they depend on. And we've actually made a lot of progress on that, and they do that. What we've not been as good at is telling them that giving back is not just a matter of contributing code, that you really have to support the process too. And so that's not happening, and there are a lot of consequences of that. Burned out maintainers, development pace slows down, developers get frustrated, quality issues show up because people just don't have the time to review the code properly, and increasingly as we see, this is a security risk. This is something that we need to address. Now, we've been working on addressing this problem for a while, actually, in the kernel community, and it made some progress, but we have a long way to go. So what can we do? Well, besides being nice to the maintainers, who are really doing the best they can, we need to help them. We need to help them maintain their subsystem. And more than anything else, that comes down to patch review, <clears throat> right? This often falls on the maintainers to, to review patches before merging them. This is a hard job. It's a lot of work. And it's something that, honestly, everybody who's contributing to the kernel should be doing as part of their job, is reviewing patches and helping the maintainer do that. That should be part of their job that they are paid to do. It should be something they are evaluated on, not just something they fit in at the end of the day before they go out for a beer, right? And similarly, the maintainer role should be people's jobs. It should not be something they're doing on their own time. So a couple of years ago, we put a document into the kernel tree called the, the Contributor Maturity Model. It's a way of evaluating how well companies are supporting the development process as a whole. So there's a whole set of criteria. If you're working for a company, you can go and look at it, see how well your company stacks up, at what level it appears there, and see the sorts of things you can encourage your employer to do to do better on this, on this, um, on this ladder, essentially, and to better support our community. This is really what we need to, to deal with these maintainer problems and beyond in the kernel community and elsewhere as well. So enough said on that. Move on. I used to, in these talks, talk a little bit about what BPF does. I'm kind of thinking that now that we are in the 
Hollywood blockbuster stage of BPS development that I don't necessarily need to do that anymore. Um, suffice to say, it's an in-kernel virtual machine. It allows the loading of code from user space into the kernel at runtime to carry out a whole number of tasks uh, with a high level of safety and high performance. So there's a lot been going on with BPF over the years. This is actually a real movie they made, by the way. Um, anyway. Um, so I mentioned these two, these two changes that were merged for 6.9. BPF programs can do a lot of things, right? They can change the results of system calls. They can redirect network packets. They can make security decisions, right? So loading a BPF program is a highly privileged act. In current kernels, you can either load a BPF program or you can't. The BPF token mechanism adds a much more fine-grained capability to this. So you can say this program can load tracing, or this process can load tracing programs but nothing else. It allows you to say create a container, inject into it the capabilities to do exactly what that container needs to do and nothing else. So it should hopefully make the whole BPF thing somewhat more secure in that sense. Uh, the other thing that was added is a thing called the BPF arena. This is a mechanism for sharing memory between a BPF program running the kernel and a user space program. And it allows for doing some interesting things like creating elaborate data structures and so on, including following pointers and such, which is interesting because the program running the kernel, the BPF program, is running in a different address space than the user space program. But um, they found a way to make pointers work in both contexts. Um, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of trickery there. Uh, but complexity is kind of the name of the game for a lot of this stuff. There's a whole lot of other things happening. SCAD EXT is a framework for creating CPU schedulers. You can replace the entire scheduler in BPF now. People have used this to pretty great effect to, to make special purpose schedulers, to make their own workload work better and so on. A lot of interesting stuff has been done with that. Para-virtualization scheduling is a little bit different. This is a relatively new patch that's just come out. The idea there is to sit between a host running virtual machines and those virtual machines and allow the CPU scheduler and the virtual machine to communicate with the host and optimize the scheduling decisions so that things run as well as they can. And there's a BPF component to that. Fuse BPF allows moving some of the file systems and user space logic back into the kernel, but supplied from user space to improve performance. There's the BPF network device. It was actually merged a couple of releases ago. It's a, a new virtual network device that gives much better control over network traffic going into and out of virtual machines. P4TC is a whole new data plane with a BPF component to it. It's a much more massive addition to the networking subsystem. It's been under review for quite a while and may be under review for a fair while yet. We will see on that one. And then there's the issue of standardization, right? For years, the BPF virtual machine has been defined as whatever the current kernel does, um, which has occasionally been problematic, but it gets worse if you're trying to do things like embed BPF virtual machines into hardware and use it in other contexts. So we need to have a standard that says what the virtual machine actually is. There's a process fairly far underway in the IETF to do this and we should see a standard coming out before too long for at least the initial version of the BPF virtual machine, which will probably be several kernel releases behind what the kernel BPF machine does, but it's a start. So challenges in the BPF world include complexity. Uh, if you're, as you're trying to continue to assure yourself that BPF programs are safe and you load them in, and, but you're allowing much more complex functionality. That's, that's a really hard task in some cases. I mean, it's theoretically impossible to do. But they're, they're trying to do that. And resistance to some of it. The, the SCEDX stuff that I talked about, the CPU scheduling framework, was rejected for addition to the mainline kernel. It will not be there, at least anytime soon, because the scheduler developers were worried about the fragmentation of scheduler development effort. They were worried that vendors would require users to run their particular special version of the scheduler and other things like that. So we will see this in other contexts as well where people simply ask, what, how far do we want to go with BPF? And, how far, and where do we want to draw the line and say, no, sorry, this is what the kernel does, and that is what we will support. All right, Rust, again, hopefully fairly familiar to people at this point. 
a memory safe language for the kernel that hopefully will in the future allow us to write kernel code that is free of a whole lot of the sorts of bugs and vulnerabilities that are just inherent in the C programming language that we have used thus far with the kernel. So the status of this is that the core support is maturing. It's been in there for a little bit over a year now, We're slowly adding features and stabilizing features in the Rust language as well, which is the other piece of this whole thing that needs to be done. We're slowly adding subsystem abstractions so that you can write drivers that deal with these various subsystems. It's going a little too slowly. And there's a couple of sample drivers in the kernel now that you can look at to see how this stuff is done. There is at this point still no code in any production kernel that is written in Rust, at least no mainline production kernel. But we'll get there. Um, Rust, of course, also has some challenges winning over maintainers. If you are a subsystem maintainer and you're going to accept Rust code in your subsystem, you have to understand that code. You have to be able to review it. You have to be able to change it. You have to be able to fix it, which means you have to learn the Rust programming language. Rust is not the easiest language to learn. Um, it's rather different from C. And as we've already discussed, maintainers are already overwhelmed. So asking them to take a month out of their life to get really good at Rust is, is a big ask. So some maintainers are more enthusiastic about this than others. Um, this, this battle, I think, is slowly being won, but there is resistance in areas to doing this. <clears throat> the, the API issue is an interesting one I could talk about the whole time, but imagine you're writing a, a Rust abstraction to deal with, for example, the concept of an open file within the kernel. It's going to be tempting to write that in a way that a Rust developer would do using all the modern techniques and all the features of the language, but then what you get is something that looks very different from the existing C interface that does this management. And this gives you two different APIs and a big glue layer between them and all kinds of maintenance hassles. So this has been rejected. An attempt was made to do this and it has been rejected. And the, the rule is that if there are improvements to be made in the API, they must be made in the C API, then the Rust stuff can match it. This isn't entirely welcome to the Rust developers who really just weren't looking to improve the C APIs in the kernel. But, but it is, I think, necessary for the long-term development and maintenance of our kernel. And getting the abstractions upstream. We have a rule in the kernel that says you don't merge code that is unused into the kernel. So you can't merge a whole bunch of subsystem abstractions saying someday a driver is going to need this. Right? There needs to be a user for it so the maintainer can see how this stuff is actually used in the real world. But then you can't merge the driver that uses it until the abstractions are upstream. And so there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there that we're trying to work out. Um, it's going to take a little while, and it has, slowed, it's, it has slowed things significantly at this point. But I think we're getting there. So overall, with Rust, I would have to say, so far, so good. It's moving more slowly than people would like. But I think we're slowly getting past the experimental stage. And we will see sometime before too long some actual useful code in Rust in the kernel. And from there, life is going to get interesting. So the last thing I wanted to get into in the time I have left is this whole concept of confidential computing, which you may have heard about in some of the other talks here. And it's going to be a significant change to how some stuff is done if it goes forward. If you are running a machine in your basement, you've got a server sitting on a computer in your basement, you have control over the hardware, you have control over the software, you can see the network plug, you're in control of the system, you know what's on it, and presumably it's doing exactly what you intended to do. But that's not how we run our stuff anymore, right? We're running servers on some virtual machine in somebody's cloud environment out there somewhere you don't really even know what country this is in anymore. So, Running as a virtual machine is a rather different environment, right? If you are running as a virtual machine, the host computer, if it is hostile, can look at your memory and exfiltrate your secrets and give them to the world. It can change that memory and totally change your view of the world and change how your virtual machine behaves. It can monitor and corrupt your network traffic. It can corrupt your, your disk traffic. It can really change every part of the world that you see. There's nothing that you can count on anymore. So how do you put a business critical machine into an environment like that and trust that it will be safe, especially if that machine is maybe running virtual machines owned by an attacker who's going to try to compromise the host and get to you or anything else like that, right? This is something that people really worry about and there are reasons to worry about this stuff. So what do you do? How do you reestablish trust in a setting like this? 
Well, I decided to get a little bit philosophical in explaining this and went back a few centuries. Um, if you read Meditations on First Philosophy by Rene Descartes, he had a similar problem. He wanted to say, what can we really know? If we distrust everything, if my eyes are lying to me, if my memory is lying to me, what can I really know about the world? What can I conclude? And his answer, of course, is fairly well known. All right? I know that I am thinking. All right? It is indisputable that I am thinking. If I only think that I am thinking, well, okay, I'm thinking. So from that, he went on and concluded that he's thinking he must exist to be able to think. And from that, he went on to prove the existence of God through a couple of logical steps that I am unable to reproduce. But, um, <laughs> but that's where he started. So if you take a similar sort of approach to virtual machine, what you, can you count on? Your memory is lying to you. What you see is lying to you. What can you count on? And it all starts with this idea that I am running a secure CPU, therefore I am in control. And what does that mean? It means hardware that gives you a secure and verified boot chain, cryptographically secured so you know that it hasn't been tampered with. CPU attestation, you can ask the CPU, are you an Intel CPU that has all these com secure computing features in it? And it can answer back to you, again, cryptographically signed, so that at least in theory, it cannot be faked. You know you're actually running on that CPU and not some fake CPU that only pretends to do this sort of stuff. Once you have that, you know that the CPU can provide other features like encrypted memory, so that you can work with your memory, you can read it, you can write it, but not even the host computer can read the contents of your memory anymore. Right, the hardware will ensure that that doesn't work. Once you have all of this stuff, then you can start to be somewhat sure that the environment you're running in is actually the environment you think it is and that the secrets in your machine are safe. That's the idea. There are a whole bunch of vendors out there making features to try to support this concept. Pretty much every major CPU vendor is working on this. All on the idea that you really can't trust anything all, right, all you can do is hopefully trust the hardware. And this, this, of course, has been interesting because some of these secure computing features have already shown, been shown to have vulnerabilities of their own, speculative execution problems and others, but maybe someday we'll get past all of those. So in theory, in theory, we have the basis for an actual confidential computing environment where we can do this. But there's a couple of challenges, of course. One being, is this plausible? That question can be answered or asked at a few levels. Can the hardware be made to work the way they say it's going to work? This is a very complex mechanism. We'll, we will see if they can do that in that. But that's not the end of the story. Right, the network adapter on this laptop I'm using here is written with the idea that the adapter might break and hopefully it will do the right thing and not set the computer on fire. It is not written with the idea that that adapter might be actively hostile and trying to compromise the system and trying to DMA over my memory contents or do anything like that. It's just, it's not written with that in mind. But if you're trying to run in a secure computing environment, you have to write your drivers with that in mind because otherwise you have an attack point. So every bit of code that is running within this secure computing system has to be written with that level of paranoia. And that level of paranoia is very hard to code. It's very hard to write. It uh, adds a lot of complexity to your, your subsystems and it can impact your performance as well. So it's hard to do, but it's also hard to get past the maintainers in the kernel community because they've spent years making this driver work the fastest they can make it work and to actually get the performance out of the device the device is capable of. And then you're going to add all of the secure computing stuff for a threat model that perhaps they don't believe can be defended against towards a goal that they don't think can be achieved. And so there's going to be resistance to merging some of this stuff along the way. And we're gonna see some interesting fights. But there's also a lot of money behind this and a lot of people trying. So we will see where they get with it. And if they get there, then maybe we will have secure computers at some point in the future. And with that, my time is running out. Um, this is just a slide full of stuff that I could have talked about uh, and didn't, I really, couldn't cover all this going on in the, in the kernel community, even with a full day talk, much less a 40 minute talk. So there's a lot of stuff I didn't get to. I do have a couple of minutes for questions. So you can 
if there's something somebody's burning to learn about, you can ask, or if you find me around later on, you can ask as well. And with that, I do believe a couple minutes, so I thank you all for your attention. So I think we have a mic here if anybody has, has questions. And if not, we can get coffee early. No, no, it doesn't get onto the, into the recording and all that. So you actually really want to, to use it. I don't think. Um, thanks. First of all, thanks for this, and thanks for all the work you do reporting on this. I think my question is actually more on the latter, which is what's sort of the, the health of reporting on Linux kernel and the kernel development? Is that something you're willing to get into at all? Well, I'm healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear it. You know, reporting on the guts of the kernel community, of course, is what I do for a living. and. Um, you know, it's a hard task because not everybody can do it. I think it's a vital task because it's a community that's big enough that people don't know what everybody else is doing without that sort of thing. So I've had a hard time over the years finding people to do that. We have recently hired a couple of people, one of whom actually can do this sort of work. So I think the health is actually getting a bit better because I've, I have wanted to try to set things up so that when I get tired of doing this, which I have been doing this for, what, 26 years now, you know, eventually one has had enough. Um, hopefully there will be an ongoing story to replace that. Right. You mentioned earlier in your talk about uh, the, like, six-year long-term kernel support going away. Is that because people who should be taking advantage of that aren't taking advantage of it? Or are people getting better at updating to newer kernels? Well, I think some users are you know, sticking with the newer kernels. You know, Android, for example, I think tries to stick within that. And yeah, I think the users weren't really there. I don't know if, if Sasha, you want to add anything to that. Um, Sasha here is one of the stable kernel maintainers, and he's saying there just weren't many people using 419 in the older ones. It's just, it's too old at that point. If you're trying to keep a kernel that old going, the way certain companies do, you have at that point backported a thousand drivers and features into it, and you have something that doesn't look like 419 at all, and it's definitely not maintained by the stable kernel maintainers. Yeah. 